I'm Nathan from Arms and Armor. I'm Craig. We're here for a whiskey and weapons today about Maker's Marks. Marks. <laughs> Cheers. So you may have noticed, if you're a sword person, that we don't have a Maker's Mark on our swords. Right? And uh, we've been asked why a bunch of times, and finally we kind of thought about it a little bit. And there's several reasons why we don't have a Maker's Mark. And uh, one of them is historical to us, where we used to have a Maker's Mark and it got lost or broken. When do you think? Yeah, broken. Uh, late, late 90s. It was a double A with a crown over it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something we'd had professionally made as a Maker's Mark and used it for quite a while. But um, when it broke, shattered after you use them for a long time, they, they can do that. But it also coincided with, in the late 90s, when the internet was very first starting up, a uh, sword community frenzy, frenzy <laughs> slash, uh, you know, worry that the maker's marks being used at that point were going to cause damage in the blade. Some of you might be old enough to remember this. And uh, so when people were striking maker's marks in blades, because you do that when it's hot usually, um, that they were worried you were inducing a weakness along the blade. And so at that time, uh, when that kind of blew up and everybody was like, oh, we shouldn't do it. And some people were saying they wouldn't buy them without maker's marks and stuff. It broke and we just didn't end up replacing it really. We've thought about bringing it back at some point, but that is, wrapped up in why do you want a maker's mark on there yeah. right and that comes down to you know what are you doing as a maker and how important is that you kind know branding kind of, yeah you know it's like you know it, what are you going to do to make it yours we've been around so long and we've made so many things over the years that are pretty recognizable and kind of community-wide that we felt you know, we can make a good sword and people are out there buying them all the time. And, you know, if there's a time or two where people will come in and say, hey, is this sword yours? And we can tell instantly if it is yeah. something we've made in the past. It's not like you're gonna misidentify it as somebody else's, so. Yeah, we do stuff differently enough from other makers. You can yeah. tell when it's ours, if you yeah. know much about swords. Yeah, when you're in the Our, community. and it's style and yeah. function and, you know, kind of the types of things we make. So, um, and that's a little bit more of a medieval attitude towards it. This is uh, the second reason. <laughs> because the way that people use maker's marks today to indicate who made the sword is pretty unmedieval. Very unmedieval. Right? Yes. So I have three historical medieval swords here from the Oakshot Institute collection. I'd argue that none of them have maker's marks no on them they have two of them have marks i don't think they're maker's marks so let's take a look mm -hmm. at these and one of the reasons why is in the uh awareness of doing a craft and being a person who makes things in the in the uh community in the middle ages you did not put yourself above and beyond um well, God for one in any way, shape or form, but just the hubris of putting your mark on something, even the artists of uh, paintings and sculptures at that time did not do that. You don't start to see that until you get the humanist influences after the expulsion from Prague, I believe it is. And then um, you get this, oh, I'm gonna take credit for it. Prior to that, taking credit for it, would get you stamped down, not only by your peers, but by the community at large, where the hubris to put your mark on it was considered very gauche and, and sure. unseemly and downright kind of evil. Yeah, right, you're making a stained glass window or you're making a, a sword, which is yeah. a cross, or you're making a painting in the church. You're not making it to glorify yourself. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely not about you. Yeah. And that's why most of the early marks are almost certainly going to be where the, um, 
funds came from to produce it, i.e. who owned it in a sense, not as an individual or even a noble, but probably some kind of armory or collection of uh, things, a, a place that was producing arms for warfare, or it may well be some kind of incantation or something like that, but almost certainly not a personal mark. And this goes mm -hmm. all the way back to our very first blades like Ufbert mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Ingori. Ingori, yeah, mm -hmm. where those are not makers, right? One is translates basically as the angels made me, and the other one is a bright tooth or wolf's tooth or something like that. Now, mm -hmm. there's been some research that indicates that may associate with like a large um, uh, religious production center that would have had that kind of idea going, mm -hmm. but you also see it being done by multiple different makers. So it's probably much more about it being a power word, Excalibur, than mm -hmm. it was about being who made it at all. Totally. So this sword, this is what, 12th century? Yeah, yeah maybe a little later. Yeah, yeah, 12th, 13th century. Right, so this guy has no marks of any kind on the blade. The oh, it's fine. <laughs> the only mark is on the pommel, and it's on both sides, and it's a cross. Right, and that wasn't the person who made it. This was a symbol that was important, probably to the person who owned the sword, yeah. something like that. And crosses are pretty ubiquitous across the Middle Ages, as far as being, if you're going to have a mark. It's very easy to chisel strikes, but it also invokes the power of God and all those things that sure. come with that. This German longsword from the late 15th century has a footed cross on both sides. There's no reason to think that that was the maker's mark. Right? It may well have been something about the armory or the collection or mm -hmm. whatever that it was in. This third sword has a lot of marks on it. Right? This is the one that Ewart thought maybe uh, represented the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on it. And it's got right, two crosses uh, on it and a kind of Holy Trinity uh, symbolism sun, on sun it. Sun symbols. Sun symbols. Out near the tip is a hand doing the benedictus right there yep. right so this has nothing to do with the maker right this is a, a benediction right it's a prayer that's on this sword instead of somebody's name mm -hmm. who made it and would have been made for someone of very high status who had the funds and the ability to pay for that yeah. um all of these things would be associated in that way where we oftentimes just blow through and don't consider the economics of something like this. Mm -hmm. Putting a mark in a blade takes time and effort. Yes, it's uh, modern makers are about putting their brand on it and such, but as we discussed, that wouldn't have been a goal for them until, mm -hmm. you, until you get to the Renaissance and then you start seeing the rapier blades with all the me facets and things like that in them mm -hmm. where which means um, made me yeah, yeah. and the, and mm -hmm. so then you start to see that happening and but you also start to see people signing their paintings right. and portraitures this is and, after leonardo yeah and michelangelo yeah. right it's this yeah. renaissance moment when yeah. the the master becomes yeah the motivating force in the value of this work Right, right yeah. a whole bunch of ways. So we've yeah. got some other swords in the Yoke Shot collection, like one that says, uh, Sahagun may fetch it, and uh, mm -hmm. others, they're signed Andrea Ferreira, and all these, but these sign blades are late. Yeah. So these are, the rapiers are 16th century, the uh, broadsword is 17th, yeah. 18th century, right? Uh, so they're way after. So that's one of the reasons when we think about it, that putting marks on our swords isn't super appealing to us because it's it's kind of anachronistic about these yeah. things. Yeah, and even in the case when you do see 
marks in these blades like these footed crosses or the Passau wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, the wolf mark appears all over. Would have been a production areas sign of this is a high quality piece made by us, but it was a communal thing. Uh -oh. It was a communal <laughs> thing as opposed to it being like, this is from this forge. Mm -hmm. um, and when it became known as a sign of quality, as several of these marks did, other people started adding them to their blades, whether they were making good uh, uh, blades or not. So you see mm -hmm. these weird variations of the Passau Wolf being done all over Europe. Sure. And it was not a thing of copyright or anything like that, because that concept wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. It was the makers trying to say, this is as good as that kind of blade. And we see that even in probably some of the, the weirder Ulfbert blades where mm -hmm. Ulfbert became some kind of a legend as, as, as a mention on a blade. And so other people start doing it, whether they can spell Ulfbert or not, they're still right. trying to do it, exactly. right? Which also <laughs> helps explain why a bunch of the inscriptions and blades don't actually say anything. Yeah. Right? They're like, oh, it's misspelled. Well, it's so misspelled, it doesn't spell shit. <laughs> yeah, it's someone putting a bunch of symbols in there. Someone who's illiterate <laughs> going N's and I's seem to be yeah. popular in blades, so that's oh, what I'm going to do. Yeah, Lines, squares. You see that? The moon moon brand has uh, tiny little square dots kind of down in the fullers. There's mark there, but it's very, you know, minimal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was indicative of either this is mine as an ownership thing by some power, not necessarily an individual, and um, this belongs to the Dutch. Dutch, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when you see makers' marks in the medieval blades, take a, take a beat before you start saying, "Ooh, it's it's this maker, or that maker, or anything," because there's there's no indication that that's no. right. <laughs> Aside from the fact that in the medieval period, you very generally did not have a single smith. Just making the whole blade. Oh no! Right? You no. had you had a smith making a blade, and then a cutler making that blade into a sword, mm -hmm. which is totally different. You have all kinds of groups of people. Sometimes you've got whole workshops doing different parts of these processes. So it it, yeah. it just doesn't work that same and way. Who, and who puts the mark in there then? Right? Is it the cutler doing it? Is it the smith doing it? It's easiest to do it when it's you know, prior to any kind of heat treat attempt, but many of these blades were relatively soft mm -hmm. and some of them are only heat treated in a portion of the blade. So you could strike it just as easily if it was uh, than other, like with a chisel, if it's cold, you, it's gonna it's strike fire. the same way. <laughs> yeah. um, the other result is, you know, is that mark from the cutler or the, or the smith, but also, is the cutler being paid to put a certain mark in them for whoever's buying them all, which is almost always the case of what we're probably thinking is, is the truth of the matter. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the Duke yeah. sent a letter to Paso and said, mm -hmm. I need 27 swords for soldiers, three swords for my knights and one sword for me. The one for me should say this on it. Yeah. And mark all the rest for the cross. Right. Because we're Christians. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, how, so much charge, how much extra do you charge for that? Right, exactly. <laughs> what, another interesting side note is um, uh, Roland and a couple other researchers have noticed uh, and started to document... Roland and Marsek uh, is Dimicator. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, to, um, that a lot of these marks are right on uh, the, the cog of these swords, the center of gravity where it wants to balance if you put it on your finger. Um, very well may be something that is being done to mark that spot, um, but it also could be, and yeah, I keep harping on the economics, is that it's the easiest place to do it when you have a small square little medieval anvil and you're going to strike it, doing it right where it wants to balance is going to be way easier than trying to strike it somewhere else yeah. uh, and do that. Yeah. Yeah. So There's a really easy way to tell where the balance point on a sword is. Yeah. Lay it on an anvil 
and see if it falls off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then you can hit it right yeah. in the center. <laughs> so yeah, and that and that very well may be an indicator of where they want the cog to be. Um, whether that's decided before the blade is assembled or not is another thing, you know, that you know you could you could make an argument for that, but then you have to have a very advanced knowledge of the perceived use of the blade down the line from you because you're not the one that's going to be assembling it ever, right? So it's that creates a, a economic disadvantage at that point, right? It's kind so, of it's just Occam's sword razor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and the music, these are cool things to talk about when you're drinking whiskey, but it's also uh, you can go down the rabbit hole. Okay. And just keep going round and round with arguments like these things. So, oh, okay. yeah. so in the end, <laughs> we don't have a maker's mark. We're unlikely to get one. You all know what our swords look like. Yep. If you don't know what our swords look like, as you learn more about the sword world, you'll learn <laughs> yeah. what our swords look like. And, I don't know. Yeah. It's kind and of it's, punk rock not to have a mark. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and it's fine if you do put a mark in your pieces out there, makers, man. Oh, yeah. More power to you. Please keep doing it. And it does, not, it does not make it weaker no. if done correctly kind of thing. No. Uh, some people etch them in. All that's fine. All that's period. So, you know, it's one of those things where people sometimes want to simplify it for their minds today. And it's like trying to simplify any kind of complex human experience that we have. So if you want to come up with one reason the turmoil in Haiti happens, you know, go ahead, but there's no way to there's narrow it down. Of, that there's easy. a lot of reasons. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a lot of reasons. <laughs> yeah. So no Maker's Marks for us. Thank you for watching. This Maker's Mark is delicious. This is enough Maker's Mark for us. Cheers. Cheers.